Well, good morning, everyone. And um, I hope that I can, we can discuss together some of the ideas that shall come up. I'll just bring them up as we go along. But this gives us a good opportunity. And I thought I was inspired by this because of the peculiar times we're living in and how change has been sort of restricted and, 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 and affects people and everything else in a, in a very different way as well. But I was going to start by looking at change as something inherent within ourselves. And I thought before we start, we'll do a little practice together and just do a little exercise so that we can have something to, as it were, work with. So, if you get yourselves ready and to do a small practice, about 10 or 15 minutes, that's all. And we'll, and I'll ring the bell when we're finishing. So when you're ready, let's be in the practice together. And we'll just go, we'll start the longest of counting. And um, then I'll just say, do, do your own practice after that for uh, 10 or 15 minutes and I'll give some instructions um, uh, in, in, in a while. So when you're ready, begin the practice, the longest of counting, and then we'll settle down from there. Now bring your attention to the top of your head and feel the movements in there and concentrate on the very top of your head and then very slowly scan round in a circle round your head at the top coming slowly downwards. And bring the attention to your face and slowly scan down your face, feeling the different elements or the change inside the face. And take your attention to your neck and scan slowly down your neck. And then to your shoulders. And then slowly bring your attention down one arm, starting at the top and coming down through the forearm, through the muscles at the top and feel the joints. Come down to the hands. Then take your finger, say the index finger, and scan along that. And you have the skin and the flesh. and the bones and 
and the joints and the nail. and slowly finish the practice and return to normal breathing. So, So, we took their primary element, touch, and we scanned through the body, just to the top part quickly, fairly quickly, to, to get, I wanted to get the idea of a Nietzsche and sort of set it up so that we can feel it and it's there. And to be aware of it. And um, we have our world coming in through our senses and we process it and we make it constantly at fantastic millions of times from our through our senses basically and um, as I was thinking about when I, I gave the idea of this talk I as I said before I was inspired by the idea of change because I think it's a very primary element to look at and we can see it very easily in a way as well. And um, I was trying to think of how to develop this. And um, I went to my good friend, the textbook, the Sudi Marga, and I thought, well, I'll, 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 we'll talk about it, or I'll talk about it through the idea of the five aggregates and way of structuring it, having a look at how we see change and we use it to make up our world. But I don't want it to be a sort of Abhidharma talk, but I thought at least I'll, I'd use that as a framework. So in the um, five aggregates in the Abhidharma, they take the first basis as the primary elements. And they, they talk about earth, air, fire and water. So earth is hard, as it were, Air is movement, fire is heat, and water, they say, is cohesion. But of course, we can feel water in the sort of floods and things like that as well. So we have these primary elements, and they are what come through us, come into our, our, our body. That's how the world comes into our body, through those uh, primary elements and um, the body itself just to remind everyone of course is touch and the um, so we can feel touch all through the body and each of there the eye has light coming through and they say at, in the retina at the back of the eye there is a, a link with the mind very important so eye consciousness the ear is sound, movement, 
And of course, we pick that up through uh, 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 the mind, the consciousness element in the ear, the nose, smell, of course, and the tongue with its fluids. And that, of course, picks up taste. And they say each door comes through and it links to consciousness, to chitta, you might say. I don't want to use those terms too much, but I could use consciousness. And that, those chitters link to each other in a place they call the heart base, but we won't worry about that too much, but that's where it all comes together. So we have this physical world and it comes in onto us all the time, constantly. And we have a mental world which, which we are, I'll talk about a bit more, and we bring to the, to, 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 to together and um, fire these primary elements through the, to the basis there. And then we, by, by experience, life experience, we change them and we, we form them. And they say from these first elements of touch and um, earth, air, fire, water, we make some other prime uh, uh, elements from this space. We define from fire these elements and we define a space. We define um, a, ch a change of matter that's grow these uh, elements that are made up. So we have the world, the physical world, and we very quickly in the heart base create the world the physical world that we know uh, constantly. And of course, we take this world and we react to it and we have built, we build with it. Now, the primary mental thing, of course, is consciousness. And this um, brings the physical world, the world that comes into our senses and the mental world together. So we cognize the world. So that's where we create our sense of space and growth and um, uh, as well. And um, this, this starts um, and it's through the consciousness that we start our investigations. We, um, we constantly oscillate, as they say, between our physical doors and our mental world, which we've built up as we, as we live and we experience. And so this is where we touch. So the world touches in on us, our mental world touches and vibrates and the two together react. And the mind can operate, it can grasp for something or it can reject it or it can do it on a positive way. It doesn't have to grasp, we could, we could just sort of see it and accept it as it is, and, or, or, and, and it can have equanimity, it's sort of not reacting strongly to it in any way as well. So we can have a, a, a positive or a negative effect. We can be happy, consciousness, they say, coming up, so we see something and we want it, I want that. Or we can, and, and that, that happiness, can either be, actually it can be both sides. We can be happy because we want it. And it can be, that's motivated by greed. And we can um, reject it. Um, or so we can be just happy and we can just accept something and, and enjoy it for what it is. So there's, so in, 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 in our very first um, mental reactions, we have these qualities coming up of, of grasping things of, of them and responding to them. Now in the, the Sudhi Marga, they say that with consciousness arises formations. And they, they say that the formations are very close to consciousness and they have the characteristic of amalgamating. So we learn to amalgamate, to bring together things and um, the texts they use, or, or the terms they use, are those of you know the uh, Dan Abhidharma at all. It's the chitasikas. So they say with, with, with formations, we touch onto something, we, we, 
want to keep that touch going. We uh, apply our thoughts to it, we sustain our thoughts to it, and we bring energy into it. So the mind touches an object, so there's the mind and, it, and, and part of it, the chitaska as it were, it touches the object as well. So it's, it's all these little, the idea I think very much is that it's not a mind, it's a thing, but it's lots and lots of pulses, lots and lots of changes reacting constantly with the world. It's very, quite interesting. And from here, we can bring in um, desire to act. We want to know more about something or want to have a look at it more closely. We can decide we're going to stick with that. So instead of the mind flitting around, we have resolution. We stick with what we're doing and we have attention. We tie ourselves, our consciousness to an object so that we don't constantly have to flit around. So we have chitters, the, the basic or, or consciousness, and we have the formations inside it the, uh, and in traditional texts. And these, but both together working, resolve our, 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 our attitudes, our mental attitudes. And um, we have, and we can, we can do profitably or unprofitably. So we can either, again, bring in this idea of grasping it, of greed as it were, or we can look at something in a detached way, in a very careful way, and not be sort of tied to it in any way as well. The third of the aggregates in the Pursuit of they talk about feelings. And they say the feelings unite our consciousness. They are, as our consciousness arises, it just, and, 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 and we touch on something, it is in the past, but that frames the present and our responses, our, our volitions, push us into the future. So we, the feelings scan time as it were, and they hold together, they bring our attention together. And it's, it's what we, how we respond. They, um, they can be physical feelings, so they can be pain, or they can be pleasure. We can uh, feel something is hot, too hot, we don't like it, or it's warm and it's nice and comfortable. <laughs> so we can span between both of those as well. And we can have, in our mind door, as we come into our mind door, we can have mental feelings. So we can feel um, joy in something and happiness, or we can feel dislike or grief, as it were, as well. So um, it's this constant, what I'm, the idea of the Sudamaka there is saying this, these physical worlds and the mental worlds constantly reacting and our various facilities tying it together. And the last of the five aggregates, they say, is perceptions. And they say, this is our ability to understand. So we link objects together and we make sense out of them. So this is what we've, how we've learned something. We have a bell and we, we, we see it and it's got color and it's got shape and we recognize it. This is the perceptions that recognize it so that we can reform the world through our past experiences and through our learning in the past. So we're constantly forming it and constantly learning it, uh, how it is. And um, they, they, they also say that Sudhima is quite good, that we can get our perceptions all wrong as well. So we can see something and completely misunderstand what it is. And uh, so we can, <laughs> we can make things as they are, or we can see them wrongly. You know, we just sort of, they, they have this lovely image of the, um, the someone who sees a, I think it's a cloth flying in the air and thinks it's a horse or something like that. You know? So it's, uh, it's, it's how they, 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 it's a rather nice image they use inside there. So these are the five aggregates and these are the five ways that we touch and take this world into ourselves and we process it and we work with it, as it were. So we have the Anitra coming in all the time, the change coming in all the time. And this is happening at a constant speed. And it's very important to us 
because we can't get away from it. This is, and, and as we look through our bodies, as we scan through our bodies, we see there's this constant change going on. Sometimes we forget that and we grasp for it, but it's a Nietzsche, which is very important. And um, in a way, it's sort of one of the triggers, isn't it, for the Buddha himself. He sees an old man and he realizes that uh, this man has now changed and he's now coming to his decaying stage. And this, and this is one of his inspired steps on, on his way. So Nietzsche, very, very important to us. And um, we sometimes try to uh, avoid the changes coming up, but it's, 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 very, it's very much part of our existence. It's very much part of our, our, our being. And that's why I sort of use the exercise at the beginning just to sort of tie us down to the body and see how it has lots of a Nietzsche going on all the time. And um, we, we, see that we see it as a, we use it at the doors. We can see the world arising and we can take it if we want to. And we can either sort of go straight out to it, as it were, and say bell or whatever it is, or we can try and piss it down. But it's that change, the constant change of light coming in, sound coming in, smell, taste, that makes our world. And then we construct it with our mental facilities, faculties, I'm sorry, and, and we make them together. So, um, and I was, uh, I said, what is, another thing that really inspired me about this, to give this, I was thinking about Nietzsche a lot at the time, because of course, um, I've, you all were reading about, of course, the lockdown experience and everything else. And I have a son who teaches in a comprehensive, and he was telling us about the, you know, the children just needing to, to have change and to go back into a place where they could meet people. So as human beings, we also need a Nietzsche. And if we can, uh, and in one sense, it's very good for us to be quiet and just look inside our own Nietzsche, but as social animals, we need a Nietzsche. So we have both these sorts of elements, or both these sides to it. And I, I was sort of very struck by that. And I was being sort of thinking about it and how we, how we have to regulate it, of course, but how, how Nietzsche constantly frames us. And, it, and, and, and of course, we, we can see it as not, it has no, no self to it. There's all these things change and disappear and a thing, but nevertheless, it's there. It is part of our, our being. So at this point, I was hoping to throw it out to you guys and respond and we can respond as a, uh, as a, as a group and talk about things. Can you hear me okay? I, I can. Plugged in. Well, first of all, apologies for this weird black screen. Um, I, I put my hand up just as a sort of test really to see if it would appear because the camera on my laptop has stopped working and I see that my name isn't even, doesn't seem to be on there when I'm looking at it. It's just like a gray screen, my, my picture. So I don't know, normally you'd see the name in, in white. So I don't know how it's appearing to other people. Um, so that's one change, you know. <laughs> <laughs> my laptop is... Hey. <laughs> And in fact, you know, I'm just, uh, I'm just sort of panicking a little bit because my MacBook Pro as well, they're both very old. My MacBook Pro is 12 years old and that suddenly stopped loading. That's the one I usually use. And then this, Mac, uh, yeah, this MacBook Air is nine years old and the, uh, the camera's stopped working. It happened before and then it just spontaneously started again. So, you know, it's really riding the changes. Um, <laughs> So, yes, I mean, change. Were you going to say something, Pat? I was just saying, and decay as well. Absolutely, absolutely decay. <laughs> absolutely right, yes. And, uh, you know, speaking personally as well, <laughs> so uh, advanced years. But the perception thing is really interesting because, you know, I run groups and some of I've been doing them on Zoom and had one occasion recently when somebody wanted to talk to me after the end of the group and was really distressed and she had just totally invented something her perception I mean she hadn't done it deliberately she really believed that she had seen another group member doing something which I won't go into but it was complete you know delusion 
but she was absolutely convinced that she'd seen this happening. So, you know, that was very interesting for me in, as to how we construct, you know, how perception constructs reality, um, even to the extent of seeing things which, you know, literally are absolutely not, you know, not now. there. Yes. No, it's, um, I, yes, I think we do that all the time. It's sort of based on possibly hate and, and also wrong view. And there's just so many things coming up there, isn't there? So our perceptions are where we have constructed the world and we feel about the actions. I think we sort of project them onto, or we can project them onto things uh, very easily. Yes. Thanks, Pat. And um, I wondered what... Um, your own personal strongest experience of Anicca had been? Mine? Yes, yes, if that's a, <laughs> if that's a, a, a reasonable question. <laughs> I, ooh, <laughs> that's a very good question. I'm not, not quite sure my own is strongest one, but certainly it's a, it's a, 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 I would say it's a very good place to get back to sometimes and just sort of look at yourself and look at your body and just see this sort of changing world that's going on all the time. So I sort of, I can't remember my earliest first ones, but certainly I find it very good to sort of ground myself back in it. And that's why I wanted to start this practice, this meeting or this uh, talk as well with a practice. So we sort of looked in our bodies and looked at our change, our anicca, just to remind us that it's, I don't think anyone needs reminding here, but just to make sure that we were grounded in a nature as well. So I think some we have to, it's very easy to get back to it as well, and uh, in, easy in one way, because sometimes I've sort of found with this lockdown, you know, you're getting really fed up. And I just find it very good sometimes just to look at it and just find, come back to a nature and see it has changed and they go, well, wish I hadn't done that or this been, could have been better or something like that. But there's nature and, and we can, we just keep going. We have to keep going. It doesn't stop. Mm. And I found your instruction of becoming aware of the sense of movement at the top of the head quite interesting. I, yeah, I think because it's, 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 you know, it's a very good place to start. I think I learned that one. It's a doing a Vipassana course. And I thought and it's always sort of remained with me. It was quite good. Yeah. I think Lars used to come up in spots when I said I'd been on a Vipassana course, but at the same time, I found it very useful sometimes just to look at the body and just scan over it and just see this. Here we are, it's changing, you know, and it sort of brings you firmly down to earth again. So you can feel that earth element very quickly. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would just make an observation that the sense stars are actually subject to a nature too. Oh yes, absolutely. A nature, a nature, a nature, that's, that's how, how they're coming in all the time. And that's how they're working, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Now the epitome of a nature, I think the sense doors, the embodiment of it. The mind doors are a bit hard to see, I think. But we we can work with them. I think it's quite good to start and be and just be aware of our feelings as they arise and things like that. So we mustn't forget those either. Hi, Pat. Thank you for doing this interesting talk and <laughs> good to see you. <laughs> um, I, I, I was actually quite uh, surprised that you started at the top of the head. It showed me how uh, how routine I get, you know, because very often people start with the feet and the sort of grounding and rather than the top of the head when scanning. So that was quite a jolt just for a <laughs> start. But um, what I wanted to ask you is, following on about Dana's uh, uh, thing about perception, I know that I can often, quite often, misinterpret what somebody says or even a text. I can yes. read a text and, it's, and I interpret it differently to the, what the person was actually sending. And yeah. I wonder, where would you start with that, uh, to, to, to look at that? 
I, I, I think this the old traditional thing. I think we have to discuss things. So that's because we have build up our perceptions and we have our feelings and, and everything else. And we have to test them. And I think there we need groups to work with. So we need to have that a Nietzsche there going on so we don't sort of settle in our obsession and also be prepared to accept that you might not be right. I think that's very important. Have a sort of um, what a magnanimity, so the uh, and, and be prepared to say I I might have got it wrong, so my thoughts may be wrong, and 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 they're not fixed, you know, so that we can we can see the world anew and we and constantly. And I think the best thing to do that that way is through groups and testing people and and things like that. Constantly and be prepared to and be prepared in yourself to let go of your ideas so you don't grasp them, but you see them and you can believe that's fine to believe them, but see that they may just be based on they are based on your previous perceptions and your previous feelings and things like that, and they constantly change. They are in each other, and the world changes. So thank you for that, Fran. Just written something down. I'll just read out what I've just read out what I've written. I said perception is to do with background and culture. In the UK, you're looking for a chemist. In the USA, you are looking for a drugstore. <laughs> in, the U, in the UK, if you do a thumbs up to someone, that's a positive thing. But if you do a thumbs up in West Africa or the Middle or the Middle East, including Iran, Iraq, and Afghanistan. It's the same as sticking the, thing, the middle finger up at someone. <laughs> all these different perceptions, aren't there? So in the UK, you throw stones. In the U, in Canada, you throw rocks. In the UK, you watch a series. In the USA, you watch you watch a, you watch a season. And I guess really, my my point my my, my point there is, is there actually no kind of absolute truth? Because everybody's got a different perception of things, haven't they? Everyone's got a different kind of interpretation. Do you know what I mean? So, yes. I, I, I would say in Buddhism, they would say the absolute truth is Nibbana. But, um, but so, we, and we have to give up, as well, or have, we have to see through, see all these, and we, and we take changes, our basis, don't we, there? And, and I would say that the only, that, that's what the Buddha was saying, that there, there is a, 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 an, a, an absolute truth, and we have to develop through to it. We have to ex develop the mind so that it's it's strong and it's open, it's flexible, and it's very very concentrated and very powerful. So yes, that, that that's what I would say of us as meditators. I think that's the that's the only absolute truth that we can work with. We can say that there's a goal, there is a nibbana, and we can strive towards it. I don't feel I've got it yet, but. <laughs> have to keep working <laughs> you're not the only one who's not got it friend don't worry <laughs> sarah you have your actual hand up i want to make sure that i'm not differentiating between virtual and physical it is. well is it or isn't it <laughs> mine or not mine <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you pat um, i really enjoyed that and especially um, the practice that we did and um, I found it very interesting that you know obviously you were linking awareness of Nietzsche and Anita and I felt that very strongly and I think particularly because we started with the head and I guess quite often that's where you kind of think if there's any kind of me that's where it is it's up there somewhere which obviously it isn't <laughs> but it, it felt it's in a really good way of letting go of that because you know as we went through it so well, there's, there's nobody there is there <laughs> <laughs> so I found that really useful but, and I also like the, the way that you were talking you know if, if there wasn't constant change you know there'd just be stasis and death you know there would be no life without it in a sense so um, quite <laughs> I found that very interesting but I think especially that that link of Anitra and, and Anita was was very helpful and I just wondered if you had anything more to say about the Anita kind of side of things arising from Nietzsche. <laughs> well, um, I, to me, they, they link so together very, very quickly uh, and very um, easily, as it were. Because uh, um, 
I, I was sort of thinking of making it a Nietzsche and Atta talk, but I thought, no, nah, no. Nah. But it's, I, I think Atta is, to me, in, in, in Buddhism, it's there with Nietzsche. And so we scan through something like our finger and we break it down. We say, oh, this is my finger. And it's, um, but then we say, we say, no, it says skin there and there's flesh there and bones there. And, then, and, and if we take any of those things, we can look through them and, uh, and break them down. And you, and you see the, the, they come down to chemicals and things like that and particles and things. And so the world changes. So I find that anatta comes up very, not easily, but very quickly with it. And, 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 and we say, oh, this is my finger, which, which is for all practical purposes, we can say that. But at the same time, it's, it's all change, you know, to me. And it's also quicker as well. <laughs> of course. Don't <laughs> forget that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting discussion and, lot, you know, um, lots of proliferating thoughts. First of all, what um, Pat said about Lance, I just want to, it sort of, it seemed to suggest that Lance was anti-Vipassana, but in fact, Lance was always encouraging us Samatha meditators to practice Vipassana. Um, and he always, you know, he suggested doing the reflection on um, Dukkha, Anicca and Anatta, you know, at the end of the practice um, for a few minutes you know, just to always bear in mind those things. Um, you said that Vipassana was always dependent on, on Samatha, you see. Well, they are. They're completely... <laughs> <laughs> you know, as Ajahn Brahm says, they're two hands on the same body. You know, you, yes. you separate them. One leads to the other. Yeah. So um, uh, you, the other things that sort of came to mind while people were talking, uh, Liz's comment about, you know, perception of uh, texts and emails and stuff well the thing about written stuff which is the problem with firing off emails and so on is is that you don't get all the other things that you get when you're having a conversation like the tone of voice the feeling you know you just see the written words and so it can be more easily misinterpreted um it's also about the head you know starting with with um the head because it in the hospital patients were saying it was much more helpful for them in relaxation and, and mindfulness groups and so on to start with the feet because if they start with the head as somebody said you know the head is where all our anxiety all our thoughts they're all up in the head area so you know for patients at the hospital certainly for, for where anxiety it's it's more helpful to start with the feet because it's more it's more grounding, and then you gradually work up to, to the head. And there was a patient in an art, I run an art therapy group, and one of the patients just just in on Wednesday, Thursday actually, drew a picture of like a self-portrait type thing with um with no no top to the head. It was like cut off like a cup, which I thought was very interesting. Um that patient said. You know, he has so many thoughts going round and round and round, and it's almost like wearing a, he wears a mask of being okay, but all that's happening behind the scenes. But I thought it was interesting that there was there was no top to the head, because the head is a very neglected area. I mean, in in India they have the the art of of head massage, champissage, and if anyone's had a, a head massage, it's absolute bliss. And, you know, it's an area where we carry a lot of tension in the scalp and we just neglect it so much, you know. So uh, if anyone has a chance to get a head massage, I really recommend <laughs> it. So thank you, Pat, for, you know, sort of opening up this, this interesting discussion. Good. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Pat. Um, I really appreciated that reminder, actually, of that fundamental truth really that's so so characteristic I think of a, a Buddhist path you know the, the the constant change and impermanence and, and, and it was really good to sort of bring it back to mind and I've had a few responses and thoughts uh, starting with Diana's um, computer being on the blink <laughs> um, we've got a thing called in what is it called inbuilt obsolescence 
in, intended obsolescence, which I thought was something that we live with. You know, it, it's in it's meant to kind of become obsolete unless it's renewed or reconfigured or something. So it's a nice little analogy. But there's a phrase you used at the beginning of the talk, which has stayed with me. This is how the world comes into our body. Um, I think that was in reference to the elements and the senses. But what a what a what an idea, really. It is true that, and it's but it's quite momentous as well as quite ordinary. This is how the world comes into our body, and that's how we're connected with it in in a an ex constantly you know extending way. So I, I'm going to hang on to that idea when I do practice. Uh, this is how the world comes into our body. Um, but also, it made me aware of the practice that uh, what we do uh, as practitioners, as meditators, is we sometimes put our attention or notice what we otherwise wouldn't notice, or or we uncover aspects of our experience that would lay hidden or unexplored. You know, we open that, even if it's just to the sensation of the breath on the nose, we kind of open it up and, and really uh, explore it. So with the practice that we did, although it was very simple, it was another opening of that world of, of well, it is on each other, isn't it? Because, well, I mean, at the, at the initial point, it's there. And then you begin to realize that it's, it is this oscillation between your body and your mind that's constantly going on. And you can actually see it. Uh, in the practice, the you know the coming and going, and I thought it is. Uh, uh, I hadn't necessarily associated that with Anicca so much, more the Anatta that 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 uh, Sarah mentioned, and I, and I do remember very clearly that notion that there is no permanent self. It was a big departure, wasn't it? You know, there is no soul like spiritual self, but what there is instead is the interaction and constantly changing body and mind. And that's the truth. So I was reminded of that through your talk, really, how much it's a, it's a key point. Um, uh, and, yeah, the impermanence aspect, you know, coming to terms with that, I do remember, I don't know whether to name by name, but there's somebody here who gave a talk many years ago into a group of people in Oldham, um, it was an open meeting to start a new class in a really dreary place. Um, and he said, and he said, and I always remembered it, he said, if any of you here understand the nature of impermanence, that's all you need to start, if you like. Um, you're already almost enlightened in a way, because to come to terms, that's the wisdom, you know, there's the experience, and then there's really, really knowing what impermanence is. And and living with it, you know, not getting too uh, depressed by it, uh, you know, or really despairing about it. Um, but um, so it brought all these things back to mind, uh, you know, in our practice, etc. Uh, and even going back to um, an open night in Oldham. So, so thank you, Patrick. I put that back to you. <laughs> I'm not got a question. I don't think I might find one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just to go back to uh, the Anicca Anatta thing for me, and we accelerate it, and as it happens, after I put my hand up, Veronica has said something which has partly clarified it, that um, you didn't actually use the word impermanence in your talk, I noticed. You spoke about Anicca itself and change, um, and that's how I learned it. You know, Anicca means impermanence, and that... Uh, Anatta, my, I remember my first teacher emphasizing it does mean no self, but no permanent self. And therefore, you've got impermanence as one definition and not permanent as another. Um, so, I've never, as you say, the two are, are together. But um, can you sort of say what, something about what is it that is about Anatta that distinguishes it from Anicca? Um. I, I think it's looking at at things as a whole, and and it's the sort of understanding that wholeness is is inherent with the nature. To me, it's that. So 
we, we, we sort of we talk about uh, something like a finger. We say if we've got a finger. And, but if we sort of break it down, there is, you can see it's all made up of all these elements. In, in, in a time, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, a certain period, there is a thing called a finger there. We can all recognize it. We understand that. But there's nothing in, in there is permanent. And it's the two to be linked very closely. So that the, the anatta is the, there's no permanent self there. There is certainly a, a, a something there. But it changes all the time. It is, it's, it's, so the two are very closely bound together. And if we, we, we try and find something that we can, we can define it in terms of time and shape and things like that, but all those are, 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 are variables. So we live in this variable world, you know, and that are changing as well. So we can certainly talk about something, we can define something, but every, every element about it is there's, there's no permanent to it. And I think that's, to me, that's what you know, the, the, the practice is about, is sort of looking through that at a very deep level. And some, some of our forces are so strong and deep within us. And we're sort of learning to look at that. And also to make our minds stronger and stiller so that we can cut through that as well. It's the, the thing that is perhaps the strongest for the us to use the phrase you just used is this sense of, uh, I am, <laughs> I am me, and yet we're, you know, the, that's false understanding. So it's true, I'm trying to get to terms with that, and what it is that's in anatta, that is more than just the idea of impermanence. Uh, I also have two observations, really. Uh, just so I point out, the perception thing's really interesting in terms of, I mean, perceptions are senses. It's, you can look up what flowers look like to insects, and birds uh, under UV, which we do not see, so ultraviolet, and they're completely different. So that's a really interesting experiment in just seeing how other things see. It's the same with snakes. And then the other bit was on change and how we're always changing. Again, in chemistry and physics, we've got that from the like from a physics perspective. Uh, entropy, which is kind of the disorder, always tends to increase as well. And... Uh, that's kind of where the universe is going. But it's interesting to then, when you look at it, if you fast forward the universe, you actually end up with everything being uniform because of all that change. It just tends to uniformity because that's maximum entropy as well. So it's just interesting from the science perspective, there is there's a whole bunch of things which link into this and from what, what, what I'm seeing. Yeah. <laughs> I, I suppose it brings a different view onto it, but it's very interesting, yes. And there's a conformity, at the same time, there's, you know, uh, uh, there's in, in itself, the conformity is based around rules and laws, but they always ch and it always changes as well. It's so interesting. Yeah, um, I would agree. Um, I think m my contribution to this, because I'm seeing stuff in the, in the chat box as well. Um, Dhamma, the best interpretation or translation of Dhamma that I've seen is patterns. So patterns of nature and science is observing patterns in nature. Yeah. And yet I'm still surprised when the two match, mm -hmm. which I find also astonishing. I think there's huge benefits to be had in seeing the world through modernized reinvigorating the Dhamma from 2,600 years ago through, through our own culture and concepts um, and seeing that in, in many cases that they, they marry up um, and it, it can give us a very fresh view of the world. I think um, Pauline, you're slightly off camera, but you have your hand raised. Hi. Can you see me now? A little bit. <laughs> a little bit. Okay. There you go. Okay, thank you. Um, what was coming up for me was, um, uh, oh, there's so many things that can get in the way of seeing how life really is on a day-to-day -day basis or moment-to-moment. -moment. And, and what I was actually thinking about was, um, I've been exploring shame and 
and how shame can be for each person it can actually be slightly different and and I was I've been doing um, a particular w- workshop on um, for white people looking at their own racism and oh my god so much shame came up for me you know I was sitting with shame and it was so excruciatingly difficult but then but as I stayed with the shame and stayed with it stayed with it it started to I started to feel what was underneath the shame and that gave me some clarity I could then own what I was actually feeling you know underneath the shame and I could actually come into relationship with my own sort of how I've actually in the past colluded with racism and 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 able to see and you know it, it helps me to actually connect more with black people now and um, be more honest so it's we were talking about that kind of place where we come into um, I can't remember the words but when that when we come into relationship with an object you know with the outside world how quickly our um and our feelings will come in and disconnect us, get in the way. Something gets in the way from us really coming into relationship with what we're, we're with that object. If we don't like it, it's we have an incredible, sophisticated kind of system that brings in denial and shame, or you know, going on alert mode, um, fear anger and and they 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 kind of just get in the way so much and that's really difficult to be with um and i found you know, i sort of I, I like i i really like samita and i also like the passionate because the passionate for me because i've had a lot of trauma in my, my background that helps me to to actually be with it and to to actually get get a bit more space around it i suppose i'm I, it, with a bit of passion i'm using awareness and acceptance and loving kindness to um to kind of wrap around okay. those feelings and to create a bit more space yeah and i am i still i still am with samita it's just incredible but i do feel that the two are really um, are very necessary yeah. for me, actually. Um, so um, I feel like I've talked a lot and I'm getting a bit kind of shy now, so I just, <laughs> I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Jenny. I'm the Haywood's had to go. Um, I was um, reminded during the, the, the practice of going through the body from the head downwards, I find myself sort of, chuckling at the finger and thinking about um, the story of Hansel and Gretel when the, the witch who, who got her imprisoned asked her to put her finger every day through the, do you remember, through the, um, <laughs> um, the bars but to see if she put enough flesh on to eat her. And... Um, how that, you know, in a way, she, the witch and, and um, Han, Gretel had a stick that she stuck through the bars, so it never changed. She never got the flesh on. And in a way, that's an example of, you know, the witch being absolutely stuck in what she was intending to do. And... For me, I was get, that was going to lead on to the question about why we do find it so difficult to face up to things changing and change. And I mean, in our case, it's getting old, really, <laughs> and all the things that go with that. And Pauline, you have spoken actually very well about that. But um, in a sense, everybody here is on that journey but there are a lot of people who, or you, who you run into or come across who aren't. There's nothing we can do about it, is there? <laughs> Other people. <laughs> yeah. We have to take responsibility for ourselves and start yes. with that. Yeah. But I suppose we can help other people, can't we? 
so that yes. um, hopefully we, 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 take, we have to work for ourselves. I think we have to work with a group as well. And then hopefully you, you might start to teach as well. So you can sort of, so you give people the chance to learn some things, techniques if need be, and also to question things and to look at things. So I think it's very important, those, those three things together. Questioning, absolutely. Yes. And self-questioning. And, self and working and, 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 and not being, I think also not just working by yourself, but just also working with others. I think it's very, very important. Yes, I'm good to be there. Anyway, that was just a memory that <laughs> came to me. That's great. With the finger. Yes. <laughs> Bony old finger. <laughs> Thanks, anyway. A pleasure. Hi there, Pat. Hi, everybody. Um, I really like the title being change, actually, rather than Anicca. That's one um, comment. And it's interesting um, that Anicca has been mentioned and Anatta, but not Dukkha, <laughs> not, in the, not in its specific form. Although I thought what Pauline, what you said was, um, was spot on, actually, because change is about Dukkha. Um, uh, because you know, like with the finger, that we sometimes when we don't want to change, um, we we can get fixed on things. But and sometimes when we don't want to see change, I mean, I think that's partly a lot of what practice is about. When you sit with something and something's coming up and you don't want to actually see it or stay with it, or whether it's you're with somebody and something uncomfortable comes up, and you you just you know you suddenly need the toilet or you go and put the kettle on or. You know, it's like those moments in things like that. Um, uh, so I'd be interested in your take on why Dukkha wasn't specifically mentioned, if we're going to mention the three signs. But also, um, I think I think what I've noticed in change for me in the last few years is how much our narrative is so entangled with everything. You know, one change can happen, but... Um, we often keep with the same narrative or something, you know, so maybe getting old is about we want to have a young body. You know, we don't want to let go of our own vitality um, or our sense of perception with who we are. I mean, our whole sense of identity. I mean, yeah, you know, when we, somebody mentioned before about Anita and what is the difference between having a sense and a knowledge of our own self and what is that? What's the difference between that and knowing that we are just immersed, like you said right at the beginning, with the four elements? The, we are made up of those four elements. We are part of this world. We're not separate from it, and yet we operate through this self and that self awareness and that self knowledge. And it's interesting. You can there's change, but also what I find helpful sometimes is the word finite. When I realise things are finite. They, that can bring a real joy, you know. You might be living with somebody and they're doing a course and they'll be gone at the end of the course or whatever, or or when a marriage is over, you see the joy of what you what was there, or you know, or you move house and you suddenly think you're living in the best house ever, you know. So I just think it's quite interesting flipping it in that way. But um I just think it was just think that whole sense of change with that. Maybe that's what life is about, just permanently adjusting our narrative of how we think it is <laughs> and, and adjusting it and aligning it back to how it actually is. And maybe that's why um, the Dukkha is part of it, like Pauline said, because what we are expectations or our, what we think it is or isn't the way we want it, it to be yeah. always. It certainly isn't. I think one of the things we have to try and do is look very clearly and try and be very clear as meditators. That's what we're trying to do, actually sort of look very clearly mm. and be honest with ourselves, be truthful. Mm. Because change can bring joy as well as oh. suffering. No. Absolutely. It's not one-sided. Nope. No. Mm. Have you any thoughts to say, Pat, on um, on um, Dukkha, just to bring a, that little completion <laughs> to the three signs? 
<laughs> how they um, interrelate. I, 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 I wasn't to bring them up today. I probably could have great thoughts, but at the moment I decided not to. <laughs> I just take that as coming up there. So it's, it's our underlying theme. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we just sort of, and as you say, we decay and, and we grasp onto things and we, and or, or uh, we, in all fairness, we can sort of be glad as well we change. But it's, yes, I think it's there. I remember going years ago to a group and um, and 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 uh, it was a cabinet group and the person there said, "Oh, I I accept a Nietzsche and a Nutter, but I don't accept Ducca." You see, and it was quite interesting. And I would always remember that thinking, "Well, it's sort of part of it. It's it's not it's not a nasty thing. It's just there." But you know, so I think it's it's the most interesting thing. As well. it is a very interesting thing as well, because some people just say, "Oh no, it's not just Ducca. You know, it's not just suffering." Rah. But um, I think that, um, you know, we, we even if we're very happy, things disappear. If we're very sad, hopefully things disappear and um, all can change as well. So, yeah. Yeah, just just following on actually what, what was just some of the points just mentioned then about um, possibly the, there is some joy there <laughs> and um, how we as as adult humans, we 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 get into a rhythm where we start to shorthand things through the sense doors. Um, so that's why I think the mindfulness and meditation is like quite precious to us. Um, as a, a, but the child state, um, when we are <coughs> doing things, and we sometimes catch that when we hear a new noise, maybe there's a new contraption outside and we switch in and our minds are fully there intense trying to work out what that is and um, children do that naturally all the time I remember a, a few months ago Dave Hall did a practice and he said when did you last see a beetle and that really captivated me and he talked about the child looking at the iridescence and the form of the beetle and um Yes, and I, I think that's possibly where we get caught up as we grow and we start to shorthand um, things. And then when we see impermanence sometimes, or I, or, you know, it, it can be quite a, sh a shock to us because we are, um, we, we, we just put things in boxes like, like the idea of reading texts wrong and because <laughs> we just, you know, get kind of float across the the surface of things or I, I should talk about me, That's, you know, you, you can float across the surface of things and visually we, we, we just don't, or I don't just sometimes look at things more carefully. And I think that we can learn a lot from that child state. And um, you mentioned children as you began your talk and about their need for this reception. And I think we, we all need it too. Yes. Yeah. I just want to mention about change. I feel that change should be combined with wisdom and with kindness and not just introduce the change just quite suddenly. So let's say someone's got a pet cat, for instance, and the cat died. I wouldn't just go up to the person and go, the cat's dead. No, that's quite heartless, you know. It is, because, you know, if you're not too careful, change can be kind of a, 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 a bit of a heartless thing, really. So I feel as though it should be combined with wisdom and kindness, and it's to do with the delivery, it's to do with the word choice, what is said, how it's said, say it at the right time. But if you need to say something, you know, don't humiliate somebody in front of everybody else. Kind of bring them off to one side and say something. Not really a question in there per se, just more of a more of a point. Yeah, we have to bring our feelings in as well all the time and be aware of them, and be aware of the other person. You know, so it's very good. Yeah, so you're responding. You know, there's that change, but nevertheless, there's we live in this world of feeling and we live in this world of perception, and these are mental things, but very very important to us. Yes. Um. Yes, I, I, I wanted to say something that I, I forgot before, but also in response to um, what people have said. Um, that I had a friend who had um, very 
difficult mental illness and but got through it but she said the thing that helped her through it was this she'd been told that every seven years every cell in her body would be changed or replaced and and somehow the sense that in the inevitable process of 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 being alive would automatically bring this change and she she stayed with that that gave her um, you know, that sense of hope, really. And I suppose the teaching of Anicca is that it, there is inevitable change in the processes that go on, like the Thomas was saying in the universe. Um, and so that's the positive side. But I do remember when I started, and again, I keep getting these uh, throwbacks uh, meditation in the first class, the teacher said, uh, if you do this, you have to be prepared to change. And my response to that was, well, I'm not sure, you know, <laughs> what that means. You know, am, am I, what am I going to be put through uh, if I've got to change, you know? Um, but it did stay with me. And maybe that, um, whatever that means, it means something. I'd like to know what you think it might mean, Patrick. But but there is about, as Nicola just said, you know, the, the possibility of, 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 if you like, having a more, a deeper understanding of these processes of mental and physical and, and actually opening up and slowing down and seeing more clearly, um, you know, that's what might bring about the change. Um, so maybe that's what it was about. But the, the, there is a positivity in our nature, isn't there? That, yeah. you know, like someone said this morning, oh, well, it, things will never change and it, with the election. And I said, oh, well, yeah, they will change <laughs> somehow in unexpected ways. So uh, there's a positive, but obviously the negative side is that people die. And that's the end, you know, and that's our nature as well, isn't it? It it's means that that's going to happen. And, and so we're preparing for that, I think, you know, through following this path. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Um, I don't know whether you want to respond to the question as how, we, how are we supposed to change, Patrick? <laughs> how are we supposed to change? Well, you know, that you said, be prepared. You have to be prepared to change if you're going to take on this summative path. Yes. Mm. And I think with wisdom, I should I build, work with wisdom. And you have to, I think you have to have trust as well. You have to work with other people. So mm -hmm. it's not just yourself, but it's very important to work with yourself, you work with others. Mm -hmm. and, and together, I think it's it's a path that's, that's like that. It's not just, we don't just walk alone, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, to me. Thank you, Pat, for your talk. <laughs> Change, I, I, the first thing I noticed when, I put the zoom on was I see change in front of me, you know, my, my hair's grown longer. <laughs> People's hair has gone grayer where it remains <laughs> and so on. And um, very uh, intimately uh, see that and feel it now. Uh, I, it's such a fascinating topic because it, um, the, the um, uh, there's a couple of mentions of, uh, I know you're, you're the consummate artist as well, a sculptor, but flagging up the science side, which a couple of people have done, um, the, um, uh, the the actual kind of scientific study of change is, is what calculus is about. Uh, it, it, it's um, it put number it puts numbers and quantifies things, and I like that as the um, counterpart to the. Uh, internal consciousness uh, aspect of, of change. So those those two, for me, complement each other. And of course, calculus is a product of mind as well, a wonderful invention. But um, so that's one thing. Uh, and I've also uh, noticed that, again, in the discussion today, Samata and Vipassana have come up and uh, Sometimes, from what people have said, there's a kind of, oh, uh, is it all right to do a bit of Vipassana? Do I do one or the other? There's an element of um, <coughs> uh, sort of taking sides or something, not being sure. You know, we uh, want to people say, well, I did um, the Anicca, the, the three science practice, which Anicca is one. And, um, and, and I think the question is, that I think, 
this proposal maybe because there's this still um i'm still not sure about the two uh, other than my guiding light in this is that um uh, i'm not sure if it was lance who once said years ago that um summer to uh, a summer to approach to uh, meditation it is good for for westerners because uh we 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 are in a kind of scientific world view ra rational thought we we can dissolve things into atoms and and um uh uh l learn about that but i i think the idea was that um if you began with vipassana and you have that stark oh my god uh there is nothing there that lasts the time of shimmering uh, assembly uh, assemblage of constantly sh vibrating whatever matter and this thing called consciousness it can freak freak people out basically so we build up samatha which produces uh good feeling and joy at al and and then progressing to to vipassana we we can kind of prepared for um uh the the uh, the insight that vipassana can give us uh whereas in the east if uh, one embarks on vipassana where there's kind of a joy and happiness already people sort of need the vipassana there anyway it was something i heard once i don't know uh again if that was just my you know that that was my perception of it and it was something good it, it it's just that um, as you, as you know uh, i i'm in budapest at the moment just waiting to get back and in in the group that uh, i i i go to because it's nice to discuss things too um i i we i, I report back on my experience early on but in a but being trained in a summer to, to start with way um it, it was kind of throwing the group a bit so i felt that summer to vipassana uh not not friction but just um rubbing and f feeling i had to do one or the other then so um my point is i, I just wonder if at a, at a future time we, we could even have a discussion about that um, topic if if anybody else relates to it <laughs> if it strikes any chords uh, out there that's it <laughs> i lower my hand <laughs> no well yeah i i i think the two are linked together yeah and um uh i don't want to sort of go into too much about it now but i think samatha and, and vipassana are hand and fist you know they're just they're just they're, they're just they're there but as you as a woman used to say you need samatha you need to calm the mind and concentrate it and make it strong yeah make it focused and then hopefully you turn it to be pastor insight i think maybe then my, my problem was um uh i i fully have always felt that the two are, are inextricably linked really they come together and then become linked but uh, maybe, maybe the problem is just uh because uh, we i I, I would, you know, it's a samatha association, and uh, and, I, and and because vipassana uh, isn't mentioned uh, every time I say it, um, I, I feel you know it, it, it's got a secondary status or something, but um, maybe not. Okay, <laughs> is how to link it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I would, Diana, you've raised your hand again. So if you'd like to make a contribution and then I think we'll call it a day. Yeah. Very briefly, you know, following on from what Cos was saying. Uh, my, the way, the way I heard it explained most clearly was as I, I said before that, you know, Samatha and Vipassana are both hands on the same body and they work together. So if you practice, I mean, 
our organization is called Samatha because the meditation that we learn is a Samatha practice. It's concentration, calm, developing calm. Um, and that's why I suppose Lance used to emphasize that people should do a little bit of turning the mind to, you know, the three signs at the end of practice. Um, just to sort of encourage the insight faculty to arise. But in a sense, you know, the way I've heard it explained very clearly was that, we, we you know, it's not something that we need to sort of worry about because one will, will naturally lead to the other. So if we practice samatha and the mind becomes really calm, then insight vipassana will naturally arise. And similarly, if we practice vipassana, um, then eventually... Samatha will arise, calm will arise. So, you know, whichever practice we do will give rise to the other one eventually. So in that sense, you know, they're sort of harmonious together. If that clarifies it, I hope, a little bit. Pat, would you like to, what would your thoughts be on how to, to close this particular session? Um, I was going to say, shall we chant uh, uh, those who got booked? We just like to be mute and we chant together. It does sound always weird, but I think it's quite good fun. And we do the blessing together and finish with that. Is everyone happy? So if you get your chanting book out or if you need things like that, and let's all chant together and demute yourselves if you like. <laughs> and it sounds very... Sounds great fun, I think. Mm. And we'll, 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 all, we'll all chant together. Okay? Yeah. Are you happy with that? Yeah. Good, good, good. Bawa to so thank you next week see you next week Sadhu, bye-bye.